in our countries is not the solution to the developmental problem. <clears throat> so again, these are just hints about how we can argue not and how we cleanse our hearts. The full-fledged arguments are uh, ones that you should try to work out on your own. <clears throat> so the last step, so that was step two, reject the Hafatul philosopher. And step three is Ahiyai Ulumuddin. And that is to, so, so one part is negative, la ilaha, that they are not gods. And then illallah, and that Allah Ta'ala, what he has given us is sufficient, complete and perfect. And it, Quran provides complete and perfect guidance for our modern problems today. Now this is an assertion and a hypothesis. It is not... <clears throat> People make the mistake of saying that, okay, where in the Quran can we find the uh, formula for um, building a tractor or for um, genetic engineering? The answer is that no, Quran doesn't teach us how to do genetic engineering, but it does do, tell us how we should use genetic engineering for the welfare of mankind not and not to harm people. <clears throat> So there are many aspects uh, for Ahiyya Ulumuddin. One of them is that <clears throat> Allah Ta'ala has created all of this creation as a sign for us to understand. <coughs> so when we teach science, we should teach it as an aspect of the wonder of God. We should teach it by Tabarakallah Ahsanul Khaliqeen when we describe the miracles inside the body and the miracles of biology and the miracles of the uh, solar system. All of these are amazing creations of God and they are meant, except for the people who are blind, they can see how accurately balanced the universe is, how finely balanced it is. If, if it was one uh, decimal place away from in the 18th decimal place, the whole system would collapse. So. These are the signs for people who understand. So we need to teach the physical sciences and mathematics as the signs of God. Teach natural sciences as the signs of Allah. We should teach mathematics for useful purposes. And actually, from personal experience, I can tell you that this has revolutionary implications for teaching, for the content, for the methodology, for the pedagogy, for efficiency of teaching. In particular, I'm working on a course which I have labeled Real Statistics and Islamic Approach. And uh, basically what I did was I, I said, okay, I'm teaching this and I, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask students to make the intention to use this knowledge for the service of mankind, not to make money. So how can we use this science? Then I have to learn, how is this thing used? Now, the way that we teach is that, okay, you learn this regression and later on you'll find out how it is used. But we cannot do that. We can say, okay, this regression model is used for such and such purpose. And then you have to find out what is that purpose, how it is used, and is it actually useful? So I found out that I could not find any useful examples for most of the things I was teaching. As a result, I was forced to change. If I'm going to ask students to make near to serve, then I need to teach them things which will enable them to serve. And that requires focusing on useful knowledge. And a lot, then when we study what is useful knowledge, what will actually help change lives, we'll find that 90% of what we are teaching is completely useless. So <clears throat> today, because uh, we are not teaching, because we are following Western patterns, so people, uh, study biology and study advanced genetic engineering. And do you know what they do with that? The biologists were hired by Monsanto and other companies to develop seeds which give a high yield. And, uh, but they were, uh, they, they spend millions of dollars to develop terminating seeds so that when the seed is planted, it gives the crop. But when the, the seeds within the crop are defective, you can't use them. Why? Because Monsanto wants to sell seed every year. Furthermore, 
they engineered these crops so that they would uh, be poisonous to the natural plants around them. So once you plant them, you're stuck with them. So uh, if you plant them and you go try to go back to your old plants, uh, you can't. So this is what science is being used for. Similarly, uh, the deadliest wars in history, the, the weapons are being de designed to so that uh, they, when they develop the latest uh, bombs, all the humans will be killed, but the buildings will survive. So uh, the climate catastrophe, the oceans are full of plastic, the air is polluted. Uh, so many animal species have been killed that biologists are calling this the Anthropocene. We have actually caused uh, the change in the planetary biology. <clears throat> So all of this is because we do not teach our students, we, we, uh, because the Western methodology we adopt teaches our students that you, you will learn this and you will make a career for yourself and you will become famous and you will become, uh, and, you, and you will get a lot of money and prestige. So uh, this is not how to teach. We must teach our students that whatever you learn, you will use it for service of the creation of God out of the love of Allah. If we can teach that, then we will succeed. So Allah Ta'ala has made knowledge a very valuable thing. And uh, there are so many ahadiths and so many uh, ayat in the Quran which praise the people who seek knowledge. <clears throat> so we have to distinguish between what West call knowledge, which is knowledge of the external world, and what Islam call knowledge, which is how to live uh, a life which is uh, harmonious with the teachings of Allah, which is aligned with our own fitra, and which is a life of service to the creation of God and for the sake of the love of God. And for these methods, we need to distinguish some things which are not part of the Western curriculum. So one of the major principles is to distinguish between local and temporary knowledge and permanent and universal knowledge. Allah Ta'ala has told us a goal that this is the path you must follow, but he has not told us the steps. So for example, to put it in worldly terms, suppose that I'm told that I have to get to the Kaaba. Okay, so that's the goal, the Hajj. But how to get there, this is up to me and it depends on the time and place and position. So I'm in this country, I will walk to, to the western direction. If there's a river, I have to cross it. I have to devise means to get across. All of this thing, this is local temporary knowledge, which we are left to do. But the principles, the guiding principles, where do we have to go? What are the goals? These are what are specified and that is permanent and universal. And that is what the Quran gives us, the goals. Without the goal, you cannot decide what you should do next because we can go in 360 different directions and uh, the direction is set. But once the direction is set, then the local knowledge, which uh, how to take the next step, that requires us to look. Is there a, a, a ditch nearby? Is there a mountain? That, so those things we have to look because those things cannot be specified in advance. And in fact, this is what our life is about, to implement, to, to, to we are given a goal and then we are seen, we are left to our own devices to find the path to Allah. So Allah Ta'ala says that, so this is uh, that, who, who will seek the path to Allah? That's what we are supposed to do. So uh, one of the things that we need to reject is the distinction between secular knowledge and religious knowledge. This is one of the, most important things that we have been trained to believe that there are domains of knowledge like economics, political science, biology, physics, that this is not, religion has nothing to do with that. So we have to reject this. So no, religion has everything to do with everything. All domains of knowledge are uh, useful only if they are used for service of mankind. And if you teach person how to build bomb, but you don't teach him integrity, morality, ethics, then you have done a disservice. This is not knowledge, this is, uh, this is harmful. So religious knowledge envelops all knowledge because everything is relative to a goal. 
once you know the goal of life then you should know that teaches you what is the knowledge you should acquire which will help you achieve that goal without knowing a goal knowledge is useless so this is the important thing to understand the distinction between useful knowledge and useless knowledge because the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to pray for useful knowledge allahumma inni asaluka ilman nafi'an and he also used to seek protection from harmful knowledge so we have to understand this because the west does not distinguish between these and so without meaning to especially for teachers we can easily teach students harmful knowledge knowledge that will harm them and others so we have to understand the difference and we have to make sure that the uh, students our students understand uh, this distinction and uh, so um this is a quote from foucault that the modern human sciences biological psychological social they mean they they say that they offer universal scientific truths but they are only expressions of ethical and political commitments of the western society so we have to understand that they are teaching these sciences in a way which uh, explains how we can use this to uh, to increase our power and to increase our profits and they are not teaching them because that's their ethical commitment because they come from a culture which colonized and conquered the world so they are that is their goal that all knowledge is to be used for conquest and for power so we have to teach these same sciences in an entirely different way that these uh, these things are these ulum have been given to us for service and as a test so uh i have uh, developed an approach to this and it turns out uh, i don't have time to explain the uh, details but basically it turns out that science was imported into europe from islam uh, and uh, there was a deep conflict with the teachings of islam both uh, in scientific philosophy and in other areas with the teachings of the catholic church so for two centuries in the 16th and 17th century there was a major all of european history basically that was the period of the enlightenment when knowledge from islamic civilization was flooding into europe it became available after the reconquest of al andalus and uh, the libraries of al andalus contained billions of books which became available to europe and that is how the dark ages of europe ended something which will they will never teach you <laughs> because according to europeans <clears throat> enlightenment happened all by itself suddenly the sun of reason started shining in europe uh, but it was actually the books from islamic civilization but these books were strongly resisted there was a big battle which is they still called the battle between science and religion but it was not really science and religion it was islamic philosophy and islamic teachings uh, islamic books of medicine and islamic books of law which were actually taught for a whole century and arabic was the language of learning in europe in the uh, 16th century many many intellectuals learned arabic <clears throat> so uh, because of this conflict uh, which eventually christianity lost uh, they made science into their new religion and uh, this religion was uh, asserted that science is certain that science is in conflict with religion and um, many other false assumptions about science and these philosophies of science continue to dominate western thinking today as a result they have never been able to understand what science is and um, actually as i have been studying it i have learned that what ibn al haytham discovered and knew about science is more than what they know about science today today there is a textbook in the uh, in the west which is taught at universities called what is this thing called science by chalmers and what it says is that uh, it discusses many different theories and uh, it comes to no conclusion so there is uh, still confusion about what is this thing called science because what they want to do in philosophy of science is to prove that science leads to certain knowledge and it is the only source of certain knowledge and this is not true so because they are trying to prove something that is false they can never understand what it really is 
<clears throat> so as a result, because they do not understand the methodology of science, they've built all of the social sciences on a wrong methodology. One of the key problems with social sciences is that they claim to be universal. They claim that this is the theory for the whole universe. The economic theory doesn't say this is economics of America, this is economics of Europe. They say that this is the economics for the whole world. But actually, this is not true. The economic theories that they have developed have been developed in Europe and according to European understandings and uh, uh, European institutional structures, they are not correctly adapted to our culture and our religion. But because they pretend to be universal, because they start writing mathematics and they never say that this is uh, the lessons of European experience, which may not apply to uh, Pakistani experience. <clears throat> so we are, because we are overly impressed, we say, okay, since they say it must be universally true, it is true. When in fact, if you just think about it a little bit, you can understand that um, whatever the lessons are of European history, they don't apply to us. How did Europe become developed? Can we follow their path? Can we go on a, a conquest and colonization of the whole world today? No, it is impossible. So that's how Europe became the leader of the world. So we cannot follow their lessons. We have to develop our own ways for our own times adapted to our own culture. This gives us a golden opportunity. We have to re rebuild all of the social sciences from new Islamic foundations. Of course, this doesn't mean we have to start from zero because <clears throat> Islamic social science is really fiqh, which has developed for a thousand years. Fiqh teaches us how to behave. What is the rules of human behavior at personal, family, kin, neighborhood, community, nation, humanity? All of these things have been worked down in great detail in large numbers of books. As opposed to this, the Western social sciences are built on, in, in our social sciences, we, it's built on uh, responsibility. Uh, their uh, social sciences are built on freedom. In every sphere, they seek maximum freedom. In the economic sphere, everyone should be free. In politics, everyone should be free. But in our um, social science, we all have responsibilities to each other and um, duties, and we also have rights. The rights are balanced by the duties. My right over you is balanced by my duty towards you. And similarly, uh, for all, uh, there, so there is a complementarity. Uh, in, in, in West, they only have rights because they don't have any duties. So this is why we have a, a, a different foundation for social sciences. Now, the thing is that the problem is that we can't go and, uh, and pick up um, uh, the books of fiqh and say, okay, this is our social science. No, because this is, is continuously evolving uh, according to the local situation. So we have uh, we, the, the, the books of fiqh teach us the, the methodology, how we should use the Quran and Hadith to solve our problems. But we have to do our own effort by our own selves. There is a very nice uh, joke that was uh, um, I learned in Turkey that um, the, uh, one of the murids of one of the mashaykh went to the grave of the sheikh and said, oh, sheikh, the enemy is coming. Enemy armies are coming. So please get up from your grave and go and fight. So the sheikh came out of the grave and said and gave him a big slap. And he said that when we were alive, we fought our own battles. And now you need to fight your own battle. So it's not, uh, so our, our elders did a fantastic job in fighting their own battles. And they have developed the weapons and the tools we need to fight our battles. But we cannot uh, take the rulings out of the books of fiqh from old times and apply them without um, any thought to our current situation. We have to work on adapting them to our uh, current situations. And that is the challenge for us today. So um, I'm going to conclude. There are just a few uh, things left. There are uh, in the task that faces us, there are multiple levels of engagement. Uh, at the highest level, uh, we 
engage with Western social sciences on their own grounds. And we study the Western philosophies in depth. Now, this is not recommended at all for most people because why should you swallow a po poison first and then take the antidote? This is very dangerous. Uh, to the extent that people have already been exposed to their poison, then they should develop on trying to understand what it is that they have swallowed and how to take it out. But for those who have not been exposed, we should not expose them. So there are a small number of people who already have competence in these areas and they're already doing the battle with the Western philosophy and they are enough for the job. We don't need more uh, to study uh, Western philosophy in depth. But that's the highest level. This is Imam Ghazali did it and a few philosophers did it, but most people did not master all of Greek philosophy in order to counter it. But the real need is the intermediate level, teachers. Teachers who are teaching Western education, we don't need to deal with the big ideas, the major philosophies, we just need to deal with it at low level. We should just discard the Western approach to education, which is designed to teach a standard subject to everybody because they are teaching about external reality. We have to convert our teaching to the internal reality of the students. We have to teach our students how to live and we have to teach um, the subject in a way that it is helpful to them in living their lives. So there's the sign on a Turkish madrasa that here we do not teach fish to fly and we do not teach birds to swim. And that is really the motto for an Islamic a Muslim teacher or Islamic education that our education should be adapted to the student. We should look at who the person is, what their capabilities are, what their characters are, and what would be a suitable line for them to pursue to develop their capacities. There is a movie, Sir with Love, in which there is a high school teacher and he realizes that uh, there's only a few months left after which they will graduate and the students will go into real life and they won't use any of this thing that he is teaching them, the biology. So he takes all of the books and he puts them into the garbage can. And he says, okay, I will start teaching you how you will live your lives. And that's basically what we need to do. And uh, we have to, as teachers, adapt the subject to make it useful. And we have to uh, adapt our intentions that we are serving here, uh, that the mu'allim is, is one of the... Um, very uh, respectable and responsible uh, jobs. And we have to convey this intention to the students to uh, use knowledge for the service of mankind. And there's a, lots of um, work on this and I'm only providing a sketch, but there is books and books written about how educators, the, the adab of the mu'allim and the third level is the general public, neither teachers or, nor students, but basically uh, the general public has been poisoned by these philosophies of the West, the pursuit of pleasure and power, and this is the purpose of life. So we need to uh, counter this. We need to understand what is this poison that is coming to us, the, the pursuit of pleasure. What are the sources, the, the movies that we watch and the media, social media, all of it is teaching us to uh, pursue our pleasure and we are seeing the impact of this as this, our societies are changing and everybody demands more freedom for themselves and is willing to override social obligations and people are losing sense of responsibility and duty towards others and they are pursuing pleasure and power and profits. So we have to counter this and we have to and, and as, a, as, as a basic slogan uh, which is useful for public purposes, that Islam societies, Islamic societies are based on cooperation, on generosity, and on social responsibility towards each other. As opposed to this, uh, Western societies are based on competition, greed, hedonism, and individualism. So uh, how can we change uh, the minds and the mindsets uh, the, the beginning point, the start point is to focus on the purpose of life and uh, why are we living? Because that's one thing which 
uh, because because the west teaches them that the purpose of life is the pursuit of pleasure so we have to teach them that look you want to be happy pursuit of pleasure is not going to make you happy uh, if you drink a lot of coca cola and have a lot of cake uh, this will this is not the way to actually be happy in your life so um these are some of the counters and i have a, a talk on this purpose which for this which i have given to students which i have found very effective in leading them to understand why uh, why we should focus on the bigger goals rather than just pursue pleasure so walladhina jahadu fina lanahdiyannum subulana and this is the Uh, this is the task that Allahumma ja'al fi qalbi nura wa fi lisani nura wa fi samani nura wa fi basari nura wa min fawqi nura wa min tahti nura wa an yamini nura wa an shimali nura wa min amami nura wa min khalfi nura وَاجْعَلْ فِي نَفْسِي نُورًا وَأَعْظِمْ لِي نُورًا وَعَظِّمْ لِي نُورًا وَاجْعَلْ لِي نُورًا وَاجْعَلْ لِي نُورًا اللهم اعطني نورا واجعل في عصبي نورا وفي لحمي نورا وفي دمي نورا وفي شعري نورا وفي بشري نورا اللهم اجعل لي نورا في وامي وزدني نورا وزدني نورا وزدني نورا وهب لي نورا على نور so this is to do the task that we need to do we must ask for the help of allah and so i think i will conclude here ami to the beautiful dua uh now if there are any questions uh or any comments about the lectures uh, yes dr nawan you can go ahead please uh, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh uh, wa alaikum assalam uh, a question came uh, that when you were talking about uh, the importance of kindness compassion caring in higher education uh, and as opposed to science uh so do they have to be these teachings have to be mutually exclusive no actually we must make them uh, mutually compatible they are currently mutually exclusive in the sense that the way it is taught in the west you are taught how to build the bomb and you are it is never discussed that you have moral responsibility when you acquire knowledge then uh, you have uh, at the same time you must teach that having knowledge gives you responsibility having power gives you responsibility to use that power in ways which will help others and which will help the oppressed we should uh, we, so when we are giving students knowledge which will give them power we must simultaneously teach them how to use that power and this is not currently the way it is done and we must also teach them that all of the sciences are the creation of god and they are based on the uh, signs the, on the wonders of the universe and we must teach them how to recognize allah through his signs so again this is not what is done in the current teaching jazakallah khair the other question that we were discussing is about like for the freedom uh, march of women and uh, the that uh, is asking for certain freedom rights that they are demanding now uh, the 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 supporters of this these causes say uh, that uh, the uh, you know we should address these social issues first and then come to religion later what what would you say the reverse of the thinking required that we must um, acquire faith in our deen you see there is within our religion massive amount of resources to solve the problems of women and so we have the question and yani basically there are uh, methods of external change you see we for example you see when marxists come from um west and they uh, come to pakistan and they try to analyze 
the problems, they say, okay, we have capitalists and we have laborers, the laborers are exploited, so let's create a Mazdoor Kisan party uh, to fight for the rights of the laborers. So this is completely ridiculous. They are taking a model which was developed in industrializing England. Now, it is not true that there are no classes. There, there is a lot of class struggle in Pakistan. There are powerful people and they are oppressed, but you can't uh, import a model of, um, uh, for, uh, which was developed for industrial England in uh, 19th century and apply it to Pakistan blindly. Similarly, the models developed by feminists for action in the USA are not applicable here in the sense, they, they, and, and this is not to deny that there is huge numbers of problems faced by women in Pakistan. And if the, if the, the there are two things that we need to do. First of all, we need to understand that we are in this together. There is no uh, female and male um, uh, antipathy, just like in Islam, there is no any the the laborer and the capitalist are both part of the same organization designed to serve mankind via production. So similarly, believing men and believing women by Barlas, we are all together in the same enterprise. The men and women are seeking our path to God together, and we need their help. The women and the women need our help. So we are partners. Now, if there is some problems that women have, it's my problem and your problem, and we need to solve them. But if, they, if, if the approach which was taken in the West is that the men are the enemy and we must wrest power away from them, this is uh, likely to antagonize and likely not to work to solve the problems. First of all, the analysis of what the problems are doesn't seem correct in, in the sense that we know what the problems are. And, and, and as an economist, I know that the Washington consensus list 20 problems faced by economies. And if we were to sit together and look at the economic problems of Pakistan, none of those 20 would make the list. So basically we are using um, wrong frameworks because we are uh, following the, we are, we are accepting uh, Western social science as the, uh, do all and the end on. And we are not learned to think for ourselves. What are our problems? What are the strategies that are suitable for our culture that will be effective and succeed? We have to think these on our own. We can't import foreign problems and foreign solutions. So that's the that's a detailed answer, I think. Let's go to somebody else now. Ahmed, please. Uh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Jazakumullah khair for a very, very useful actually series, alhamdulillah. And since this is the last decision, I have two points. I will try to go as quickly as possible. If the time doesn't allow, I can stop after the first one. All right. Now the approach taken by Imam al-Ghazali, he surveyed all uh, the current doctrine at his time and discredited all of them except one. So in, in al-Munqaz min al-Dalal. So he basically yes. used the abduction, but this is a scholarly work. Uh, yes. The number of philosophical orientation are countless. So yes, I said for, that this is not suitable for everyone to do. Great. Uh, so maybe for the ordinary people, we need to establish certitude on a different basis, on the merits of the truth itself. And there is a saying by Imam Malik about that, the general meaning is, uh, whenever every clever man comes up with an argument, you will change his mind until and uh, doubt what you have until you answer him. So maybe yes. we, need, uh, yeah, we need another book, another scholarly work that will establish the yaqeen of mass Muslim on a different basis. Well, I think in al munqid min al-Dalal, Imam Ghazali said that the solution is direct experience of God. There is no other solution. If you work with your brains, you will always get mislaid because shaitan is the cleverest person. <laughs> and uh, he will always mislead you if you use your brains. Only if your heart is full with the yaqeen in Allah, then you will not be misled by false arguments. And that's exactly. what Imam Ghazali himself experienced. He said that I was in doubt until... 
a light from allah came to my heart and uh, showed me the way there was no there was no other way and this is actually the problem with the western social sciences because descartes who actually copied ghazali step by step uh, in his uh, he is the father of western philosophy uh, and he said that the only way i can know about the truth is because i know that there is a god and the god guarantees the truth but uh, and and the god is not a deceiver so what i learned um, the the guarantee of it comes from god but he put put this as an external matter of logic and not as a experienced reality and that is a crucial uh, divergence point because mm. logic does not allow us to uh, do this but the certainty of the heart does so that exactly. that's so, the difference yeah. between the cart and ghazali Yeah, actually, it's a very good point. So perhaps some like 30, 40 pages of elaboration on this point, it would make a big difference. Yeah, I and mean, this is just an. I am working on that for the philosopher uh, aspect, but as I said, this is not. Yani, once you have yakin, then you don't need to understand what Descartes did and what, how, uh, and you don't need to read the half the the all the false arguments of the. Uh, philosophers and how to yeah. counter the second point i go very quickly in in an earlier session i think the third one you mentioned that the islamization project in the uia didn't succeed fully for some reasons which yes. i agree with them but in addition to that one of the reason is it was led by philosophers and with all my respect of course to philosophers they talk on the strategic level 30000 feet above the ground so yes They I all talk about concept, but no implementation. I Unfortunately, Islamization didn't go into the phase of implementation. What we need to do now is to develop that projects. That project, every project yes. talk about a very specific and small point. Like for example, when you made your project about uh, teaching statistics and what are the subjective aspects in statistics and how they link to ideology. This is a dot project. A scale, for example, which talks about uh, how to code Islamic fiqh on the internet. This is a dot project. We need like few hundred, actually, of this dot project yes, yes. in order we need for Islamic knowledge to be reshaped. We need thousands of people. Alhamdulillah, Allah Ta'ala has given me a lot of insight into the statistics. So now the book I am working on, actually rebuild statistics on completely different foundations from what it is currently yani currently statistics was founded by sir ronald fisher uh, but on the wrong foundations as i learned as i uh, as as i worked through the islamic approach i realized that it's all completely wrong this the starting point is wrong so we can actually rebuild on completely new foundations and this is the same is true in all areas of social sciences it's not that we take the existing body of knowledge and modify it a little bit uh, and we call it islamic no uh, so we, we, what we... i am calling for the last sentence i want to say if we just make a list of <laughs> yes for to be worked on just yes. to make it available for post graduate students who want to work on master and phd yes yani it it doesn't need to be fully comprehensive even yes. if we make everyone based on his own domain and field and there may be several lists that can be overlapped and complement each other <laughs> at least that will exactly. be the first foundation of building islamic knowledge on the correct foundation that's all what i wanted to say jazakumullah khair one more time it was actually very exciting discussion and very enlightening barakallahu feekum Jazakallah. inshallah we'll have more discussions from dr zaman in the months to come inshallah so that's <laughs> not the last lecture inshallah um all right lisa i think lisa listiana um mashallah jazakallah khair for asad for the very uh, inspiring uh, lecture so i have actually two question the first one prof um uh, so uh what is your maybe recommendation or uh, how actually we should approach the uh, other people especially uh, the senior one our lecture and and teacher to realize or aware about the form of modern mutazila and the second things um 
uh, uh, from this series lecture that I noted that uh, there is kind of huge uh, bad effect of the Western teaching and philosophy to our life. But on the other hand, we also found that internally in Muslim itself, we found a lot of people who are having a bad or low integrity. So what's your opinion on this? Thank you. Yes, well, as far as the first question is considered, uh, it's a really very, very uh, important question, but also a very, very difficult question. Yani, if you are teaching in a university, how should you proceed? There is a lot of resistance. And uh, this is also actually related to your second question, that people are actually very, very strongly attached to Western ideas and Western models. And if you say that the economic theory is wrong, then they will say that, oh, no, you're just being, um, you're just being a rejectionist. You are going back to um, 1400 years and you have to live in the, uh, in the present and <clears throat> the world has advanced and so on. So, <clears throat> and what you are saying is impractical and it's idealistic and it will not work and so on. <clears throat> so uh, this is exactly because of the Motazala. They are very, very convinced of the Western ideas. And in fact, uh, even worse, if you say that, no, we should stop teaching Samuelson micro and we should start uh, developing an alternative, they will think that you are the enemy of progress that you are actually trying to uh, sabotage the progress that uh, we are trying to make. So this is, this is actually quite a difficult question. And if, if, if you, that's why um, you have to uh, use strategy. You have to do what can be done uh, carefully. You have to uh, look at what is the opposition uh, and whether it can be neutralized and uh, so this is not something I can give any general advice on because it depends very, very much on where you are, who are you, you are, who your advisor is, who your rector is, who the, uh, yani, the whole configuration of forces which are against you and the forces which are for you and the dua that you can make to Allah to change. So um, even yani, when it comes to the what Ahmed Babruk said about teaching PhD topics, may people often come to me and say, what, what can I do? And I say, look, um, if you do anything seriously Islamic, you will find great difficulty in getting it accepted. So my general advice is just do whatever everyone else is doing, get that PhD because you are not free to choose your research in your PhD. You have two supervisors and external evaluators and uh, everybody in the field. And if you say that, you know, everything everybody is doing is wrong and I'm going to build a new science, then you, you will not be able to get your PhD accepted. So just uh, imitate, <coughs> follow. Do not try to innovate at the PhD level. Get your PhD and then look at what you can do for research. So uh, it's, it's very pragmatic. There is no general principle or strategy that I would recommend at this point. Okay, so I think that's... Right, are there uh, any other second. questions or comments? Yes, for please go ahead. For the second question, sir? Yeah, the second question, as I far as I understood, you said that <clears throat> there is uh, opposition, there's people are uh, adapted, any, have adapted these Western ideals in their uh, lives and philosophy. So basically, as I said, the work is primarily on our own hearts. Once you get clarity within yourself, then you will find the ways to reach the hearts of others. So don't worry about uh, teaching others, worry about um, decontaminating your own mind. That is the main uh, message, I think. Yes, I have a higher. Uh, one question, Dr. Zaman, uh, that yeah. in our society, some people say that there is a lot of tolerance and they put the blame on uh, religious. <clears throat> Would you like to shed light on uh, the, the root cause of intolerance in our society or, or is there any intolerance? Jazakallah khair. Yes, I think that there is a lot of intolerance and it doesn't come from um, 
our religion it comes from politics yani when politics meaning also religious politics so um our religion is the most tolerant of the religions and actually we taught tolerance to europe because they didn't have this concept it was one that was adapted from the islamic civilization but it has deteriorated badly because of a uh, complex set of historical circumstances but um, as i said um, i think that uh, we should work within the sphere of our own influence so to the extent that we have uh, that we should try to learn tolerance within our own lives try to develop big hearts and try to lead by example jazakallah khair thank you uh thank you so much i think uh, there aren't any questions and it's 9:15 now so uh, to conclude uh, the series of uh, lectures uh, we are once again very thankful to dr asad zaman for taking time out and collaborating with thinkling institute uh, inshallah going forward we hope to do more courses with uh, dr asad zaman and we'll announce them uh, this same course uh, inshallah soon we'll be announcing we're going to do it in urdu also so uh, all of the participants who are here they can uh, inform anyone who wants to attend we'll announce the dates uh, there's one more thing uh, at our thinkling institute site we did a course on what is this thing called science the book that dr asad zaman uh, referred by af charmers we we did a six session course with uh, dr abdul wahab suri who's uh, uh, who used who's uh, associated with karachi university philosophy department so anyone who is interested in that course it's in urdu uh, but anyone who's interested can register for that so uh, with this i would uh, conclude the session uh, dr nawan if you would like to say anything no jazakallah khair so inshallah i think that the after uh, the urdu session we will definitely try to uh, use the expertise knowledge and uh, ex- experience of dr zaman for future talks so inshallah we'll keep everybody posted jazakallah khair thank you so much sir thank you everyone assalam alaikum wa alaikum assalam